Welcome to another edition of Ayan Oshkosh. I'm your host, Cheryl Hans. Very pleased to welcome back to the show folks we've had on, I think, three or four times in the past over the years, but they're always a welcome guest, and we always have brand new information. I learn new things, and I hope that if you've seen them in the past on this show, I hope that you learn new things as well. For those of you who may not be familiar with them, maybe you're new to the area or you're new to this program, uh, we have uh, to my immediate right, Brenda Circioni. She is the president of... Director of Training. We have a new president. Oh, we have a new president. Yep. Okay. Tra uh, ch change that on the uh, graphics, guys. <laughs> She's director of training. Mm -hmm. All right. She's director of training. Who's the new president? Pam Schubert. Oh, okay. I know Pam. Sure. Okay. She's been on with us before, too. She has, and yep. she's come to my church with you guys before, yep. too. So, excellent. Okay. And then, um, well, congratulations on your new position. Um, seated next to her is her husband, Brad Circioni. And then we have on the very end, last but not least, we have Denise Holtz. Is it pronounced Holtz or mm -hmm. Holtz? Uh, Holtz. Holtz, okay. And you are the executive director of the Day-by-Day Day Warming Shelter. Oh, program director. Mm -hmm. Program yeah. director. Oh, wow. Geez, okay. Program director. <laughs> I don't have my, my uh, titles here correct tonight. All right. Well, congratulations. We've not talked um, or met in the past, so I'm anxious to chat with you um, on this show a little bit about the new place, but have yeah. you back on and talk about it uh, at length. So um, these folks are all with Journey Together Dog Training, uh, Journey Together Service Dog Org, and they are a training program for uh, service dogs that it's a unique program offered through not just Journey Together, but also the Oshkosh Correctional Facility. And we're gonna talk all about that as part of the program tonight. So welcome. Thank you for Thanks having Thanks for us. being here. So, um, and we've also got two dogs with us tonight as well. One who's gonna be on camera showing some, showing off his stuff. And the other one is just going to comfortably lay and relax. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I'd like to be doing. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> All right, so, and, and just before I forget, a couple of dogs that we have with us tonight. We have Phoenix. He will not be on camera. Uh, Phoenix is a boxer, uh, and he's a facility dog for the day-by-day -day warming shelter. And then Zinn is a chocolate lab, and uh, Zinn is a service dog in training for PTSD and diabetic alert. And we're gonna hear all about those things. So again, thanks for being here. Let's, let's just give a little brief overview of how Journey Together came to be, how you guys started working with the prison here in town, um, and you know how that all works. Sure. Um, the program started in 2012, and it started out with an idea of having inmates train service dogs. It's been done in other states and other institutions. Uh, when it came here, we started by training guide dogs for the blind with a different organization. Over time, we got to the point that we had more inmate interest in participating in the program, and we expanded. We added the PTSD program, and over time, the PTSD program grew to the point that we have all the dogs now working with Journey together. Um, Journey's a nonprofit. We're located in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, so we are right here. We are as local as we could possibly be. Our dogs go in and live at the prison with the inmates at the prison. They start as early as two months old, and they'll be there till about two years old. Um, they aren't mature enough to be responsible to do their job until they get to be that old. And we have community volunteers. They take the dogs out and expose them to things they can't get at the prison. So, for example, we don't have any squirrels in the prison. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have geese show up at prison, and it's never totally dark. So the dogs don't learn those things unless we have community volunteers that take them out and give them all those different kinds of experiences. At the prison, we have 13 dogs right now. Um, our capacity is 16. So we have another puppy coming in in about a month and a half. We just had a puppy join us a week or two ago. And we have 43 inmates in the program. The inmates live, too, in a, uh, in a cell, and the dog lives with the inmates in the cell. The inmates are volunteers. They do not get paid for this work. So this is something they're doing above and beyond. They practice their job skills when they apply to become part of the program. They're learning skills 
um, that are applicable regardless of what they're going to do when they're released from Oshkosh. Um, so they're learning goal setting and tracking and reporting. They're responsible for the dogs as far as the feeding and medication and grooming. Um, they do it all. Well, um, you know, I guess first of all, how much red tape was there in trying to, you know, get this kind of a program approved with the warden? Because she was pretty receptive to it, wasn't she? She wanted it. Um, Warden Smith was absolutely in favor of trying to start the program up. And truthfully, dog programs don't make it in institutions without the support of the warden. Since um, Warden Smith retired, we've had a few wardens there. They've all been very supportive. We've been very lucky. We made it through COVID. During COVID, the dogs did not live at the prison because they couldn't allow visitors to come onto the unit to teach the classes. Uh. So we turned into a more classic service dog organization where we had home raisers during the COVID period. And then in 2021, um, in that summer, we were able to bring the dogs back into the prison. So. Wow. So you had enough volunteers then to take these dogs into their homes? Um, we did. We placed a number of the dogs because they were ready to graduate, so we were lucky that they had gone through that. And then we didn't take puppies. So we slowed way down because our volunteers love working with trained dogs, but they don't tend to sign up to be a trainer out of the chute for a new puppy. Yeah. So um, our volunteers do things like um, my, my dog has passed on. Um, do I get another dog or not? oh wait, I could get a dog when I want a dog and I don't have to worry about it when I travel or go on vacation and things like that. Yeah. So we have a lot of volunteers that enjoy that freedom but still get to have their dog fixed and they're helping out a worthy cause. Yeah, well, and just like with, you know, with dog rescue uh, operations, it's kind of the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks who have their own dogs um, like I do. I don't foster because the two times I tried fostering I failed so um, <laughs> they became resident dogs of mine so I don't try and foster anymore but I do a lot of other things but um, you know a lot of folks when like you said Brenda when their dog or dogs have passed on um, they may not want to take on the responsibility full-time and forever of a new dog and fostering is a great way to do it you know Mm -hmm. You have it for a while, the organization pays for, you know, all the expenses really, mm -hmm. and <coughs> you get to work with a great dog and, mm -hmm. you know, help do some of those basic training things and take them grocery them. shopping, take yeah. them to the store, take them to the park. Yeah. Um, out to lunch. Out to lunch. Out to lunch, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have a couple of volunteers that enjoy, they'll, they'll send me a note, I'd like a dog, he's going to lunch with me. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, um, you know, is how many volunteers do you have right now? Probably about 50. About 50, okay. And they all do different things, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good thing. How are the, uh, because people have asked me this in the past, and I can never remember what the answer is. <laughs> so since you're here, I'm going to ask you. You don't just let any inmates train these beautiful dogs. Um, you know, they, what qualifications must an inmate have in order for them to actually work with a dog for anywhere from 18 months to two years? So um, our handlers, we call them handlers in the program. Okay. Um, they fill out a written application. They go through an interview process. Um, they have to have had good behavior while they've been at the institution, no infractions. Um, they certainly will not have been convicted of any type of animal abuse to be part of the program. And the staff at OSCI have to be comfortable with them handling a dog. If they make it through all of those things, then they have about a 30-day trial program on, in the unit. Um, Brad tends to be one of the teachers for the new guys that come on board. And we have a four-week period, kind of like a trial. Um, they go through the four-week period. At the end of four weeks, we do what we call a clicker test, um, where they can demonstrate what they've learned as far as how to train and shape the dog. If they make it through that and they want to do the work, because sometimes people don't realize how much work it is, mm -hmm. um, if they make it through all that, then they're part of our program. Over time, they start out as what we call them sitters. 
um, the sitters allow the primary handlers to get an opportunity at a break. So our sitters get to handle somewhere between three and four dogs a week. They go through and they, they have, you know, Monday they might have Zinn and Tuesday they have Harley and Wednesday they have, I don't know, Ike. And um, so they're doing it, so they're getting hands-on experience with a lot of different dogs. And the primary handlers are getting that break in the process as well. Yeah, a little respite period yeah. for them. Yeah, so. and you know, it, it's pretty intense when you have a puppy and you're trying to potty train and all the stuff that goes mm -hmm. into that. So it, it feels good to do that. Our advantage is all of the handlers use the same commands and they do everything they can to be as similar as possible. So the dogs learn faster because the dogs think that everybody in the world does it the same because they're living amongst 40 different individuals that do almost everything the same all the time. So they learn faster. Sure, yeah. And then of course, that consistency has to go to whoever ends up with that dog once they yeah. graduate, right? Yes. And I don't know that we said this yet, but these dogs, um, for all the years that you've been in operation now, um, these dogs have gone traditionally to people who suffer f with PTSD. Mm -hmm. But you're starting something new now, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about shortly as far as, you know, um, diabetic training and that type mm -hmm. of thing. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, where do the dogs come from? Um, most of our dogs, well, most of our dogs in the program come from breeders. Okay. They um, are either donated or we get a buy one, get one half price or something <laughs> like that, right? Um, we love working with rescues. Um, however, what we found over time is if we can get the dog at eight weeks old and we know the genetic background and we know the health clearances of the, the parents, we have a far better odd of success. Mm -hmm. So. Um, while we, we keep trying rescues, um, we don't have a very high success rate and that's not the fault of the dogs. It's the fault of their environment and what they grew up in. Mm -hmm. And um, we find the rescue dogs, if they're a little bit older, love the structure of the prison so much that they don't really want to leave. They're like, I've got it good. <laughs> I know when I'm going to eat. I know when I'm going to go to the bathroom. I don't need anything else. Probably don't hear that much about anyone who's at the at the uh, right, <laughs> right. At the correctional facility. You know, so, but yeah, they sometimes don't want to leave. They're so content with that environment because they haven't had it. Yeah, yeah. So, so Brad, when you're working with these guys, um, I know Brenda said they can't be convicted of any kind of animal abuse. Um, Correct. You know, but I would think that that would also apply to domestic abuse because we know that they're oftentimes tied together. So if, <coughs> if the, the, the OSCI staff can disqualify them for reasons that we sometimes don't even hear about, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, specifically what we introduce is the animal-related <coughs> offenses, mm -hmm. you know, so we don't want any of that. That doesn't mean that they haven't done other pretty horrible things. Sure. Uh, well, if they didn't, they wouldn't be where they are. Well, exactly. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so that yeah, would not rule them out, though. Um, Domestic if, abuse would not rule them out? Correct. Okay. Hmm. Correct. Just animal, specifically yeah. animal. I guess that kind of surprises me because so often domestic abuse starts with animal abuse. Um, not always, yeah. but yeah. often it does. So I guess that, I guess that kind of surprises so, me a little bit. But I mean, not a problem, of course. Things are pretty strict. I mean, as far as uh, if there's problems with with uh, any of the folks uh, in, in their interactions with the animals, they're removed from the program. And that can happen very quickly. Um, that's one of the things that Brenda mentioned that uh, I do most of the, you know, the first introductions, if you will. And, you know, one of the things that I stress a lot is that, uh, hey, guess what? These dogs can be exceptionally frustrating at times, and uh, if you, you know, if, if they're getting under your skin, it's always okay to put them in a crate and walk away, hand them off, ask for help. You know, many many options other than, um, you know, some kind of cruelty sorts of things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> that's like one of the very first things they hear from me, and. Um, 
we don't get into that very often, but once in a while it happens and, sure. and, and you know, they get removed. Sure. It's just that simple. Well, let's, um, before the dogs get too very comfortable, let's, let's talk about um, the, the PTSD. Um, do all these dogs get trained with the exact same things? And then if, say for example, it's always been PTSD, but now you're getting into this diabetic <coughs> situation. Do the dogs all get trained with the exact same thing? And then if they're going to a person with diabetes, then you have to train that aspect? Or how does that work? So all of our dogs start out in the program with the goal of being a service dog. Um, as we go through the training, sometimes we find things like um, Magic, the dog that's with the Oshkosh Police Department, mm -hmm. when she would walk down the aisle in the store, instead of focusing on her person, she was kind of waving at everybody <laughs> as she went by, right? She's a social butterfly. So she wanted attention from other people. And so she was better served as being a facility dog because she adores everybody, wants everybody's attention, and wasn't all that worried about feeling like she had really watched out for her person. Mm -hmm. One of the other dogs we play is um, Lark. Um, Lark's a Labrador retriever. When you'd walk down the hall with Lark, Lark was focused on the person holding the leash, and if anybody else talked to her, she would look at them like she was annoyed. Mm -hmm. You're interfering with my job. And she took that job super serious. So. Our facility dogs give us a way to take a dog that has a particular personality and we can give them a job, mm -hmm. a very important job. It just not may not be for PTSD. Sure. We've had a couple of dogs that um, weren't as serious about the job as they wanted um, or they were too sensitive. They became mobility support because they were really sensitive to their person. And if their person was really upset, that really bothered them. Mm -hmm. And living um, that style would have been too stressful for them long term, sure. yeah. right? So we could find a different job for them. Diabetic alert has to start when they're young because that's a very long process to really get them to be good. Mm -hmm. They can know how to do diabetic alert and we might not place them for that and that would be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, our handlers in the program are learning new skills sure. related to diabetic alert as sure. well as the stuff that they knew now. And it's just intended to be another avenue so that we can do a dog placement based on best fit okay. versus saying, this is a job you have to fit in this mold. Okay. So when someone applies for a dog, I haven't seen your application mm -hmm. for a dog, mm -hmm. um, but... Um, is there a place on the application where, uh, you know, it says, you know, check, I have PTSD, or check, I'm diabetic, or do they go through and check the various things our that they are dealing, dealing with? Sorry. Our application process is all focused on PTSD because okay. our diabetic alert dogs are an experiment. Okay. We might do one or two and decide that this isn't the type of thing we want to do, so we are not... Mm -hmm. We're not advertising broadly, but okay. we are looking for a couple of people. Our mission is around dogs for PTSD. So our donations that come in are targeted for that. Okay. When a dog doesn't go specifically to PTSD type things, um, then we do ask for a, a little bit of help, either fundraising or money toward the cost of the dog so that our donors know that their dollars that they donated thinking it was going to a PTSD dog, that's exactly where the money went. Gotcha. Well, so let's talk about, um, you know, this, this diabetic alert experiment okay. that, that you're working on. Is it for type 1 diabetes? Is it type 2? Is it both? It's for type 1. Type 1, okay. So the dogs learn to detect the odor um, for type 1. Mm -hmm. And dogs can differentiate between a high and a low on your blood sugar. Uh, we use saliva, here I'll get it out. We brought a sample. Um, when, when a person is experiencing a high or a low, um, they use a cotton swab, just like what you'd have at the dentist, mm -hmm. and it captures their saliva. Okay. 
and they freeze it for me. Okay. It goes in a plastic bag, it gets frozen. Um, when we're ready to train then, it comes out. It gets put into something so that um, it's kept clean and we're not handling it. And the dogs are learning that this means food. Hmm. Okay. And that's how Diabetic Alert works. When they smell that odor, they need to tell me, and if they're right, they're gonna give me food. Um, the one thing that we have about it though is um, a diabetic, when the dog alerts you, has to always test. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't test, the dog is gonna give you false alarms because it's about food. Okay. And they're Labradors in most cases, so you know, mm. Labradors are about food, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, golden retrievers are too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you know, what we're, what we're doing in the program, um, we're only working with dogs that have had genetic relationships to dogs that have been successful in diabetic alert to okay. start our process off. Okay. Right, so that we're trying to not, um, not reinvent the wheel if we possibly can. Well, Zen, um, who is, um, happens to be a chocolate lab, um, and Zinn is under the table, yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I don't know, um, why don't we um, kind of show what Zinn can do? Is Zinn a male or female? She's a female. Female, okay, let's see what she can do. And um, now, I'll will Phoenix, does Phoenix, is He'll Phoenix be fine, and we okay. can actually demonstrate a little bit with Phoenix oh, as okay. well. Okay, uh, we're not gonna be able to hear you if um, you're up and about. Where do you want me? Right on um, the side wherever, um, yeah, on the side would be good. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you can hold your microphone. Um, or yeah. I tell you what, uh, Denise, why don't you share your microphone for a oh, moment sure. with? Uh, I'll just set this one down here. Is there enough cord? So are you going on that side? Yeah. All right. So tangling people. <laughs> I think that's, is that the end of it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Phoenix. Hey, bud. Come here. <laughs> we'll do some stuff with him, too. There you go. Keep coming. There you go, good boy. Oh, she took all my treats. Good girl. Down. And how old is uh, Zen? Zen is going to be two this fall. Okay. So about 18 months. All right. So what we do when we start with it, I gotta find my treats because treats are important. Absolutely, they're paychecks. That's as, right. As my dog behaviorist always says. Oh, good girl. So what we're doing is it's <laughs> called pairing. We're teaching her that the odor. Oh, good girl. Can you girl. zoom in closer, Roxanne? Maybe zoom in good a little girl. bit closer. Get right on the dog. Yeah. If you can. Good girl. Right. Oh yes, good girl. So she's learning you that when you smell that. have to tip the camera that, down somewhat. Um, good things happen. Oh, that's good. That's good. Once they're good at it, we can start putting the sample in the container, like in our sock. Sit. Okay. Oh, right. Gosh. So that'll be how she'll look for it. Down. So turn away for a second. Pretend you don't see this. <laughs> pretend. Just pretend. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you find it? Where is it? Mm -hmm. Check it. Right here, you're snipping. Check it. Oh, good girl. Yay. So ankles and knees and waists are a good spot um, where the dogs will pick the odor up off of. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we're doing. She doesn't know an alert yet, so she doesn't know how to tell me that she just randomly mm -hmm. smelled it. Mm -hmm. But that'll be the next thing that'll come in the process for her. Okay. So. Um, our PTSD skills, I can do that quick while we're Sure, yeah, here. as long as you're up with her. And because she does that as well. Cindy, heel. Heel. Good girl. So if I was um, talking to somebody and I felt like they got too close to me, I can ask Zin to cross. And she'll stand and she'll lean against my legs to give me confidence. And I can feel right where she is. In a grocery store, if I was checking out or I was going through line, can you check? She can come around and she can stand and watch my back. Mm -hmm. Right, good girl. I would know somebody comes up because if they came up, her tail would start wagging. Oh, okay. So I would know from that. Um, let me hand her back to Brad and let's get, we'll get Phoenix out for a second and he can demo with Denise a little bit. Come here. Yep. 
we'll swap out microphones. Is it? Most flirting back hey. here. Come here. Get over here. So Denise went into the prison, and uh, she was trained by the inmates mm -hmm. to do how to handle the Phoenix. Because so. Phoenix is um, going to be at day by day, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. So, so you've been working with Phoenix on things. Oh. So what are some of the stuff, things you have him do for you? Sure. Um, so a lot of the times, um, we'll just have him sit while meeting people. Phoenix, you sit. Sit. Good boy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have him do a back under. Okay. You see that. That's when you're sitting and you want them like underneath the chair, sort of in between your legs. Phoenix, here. Back under. So he knows to kind of tuck himself down and scoot under beneath there. So that helps out if we're in a tight spot. Yeah, for sure. Like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Phoenix free. So then he knows he what can. What was the command that you gave? Free. Free. So then he knows he can remove himself. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Phoenix here. Chin. Now, when will Phoenix be going into the day by day? Um, so he's been with me there since uh, April seventh. Now that oh, was okay. our like right. thirty day trial. Okay. Um, the chin movement. He'll come across uh, and put his chin on folks' legs. Uh, people find it really calming and grounding. <coughs> so he'll be a facility dog there, just like Magic is at the police department for the officers mm -hmm. there, and going out in situations where mental health might be calmed in some way by having a sure. facility dog there. So um, Phoenix is going to be calming both the guests there as well as the staff. Yeah, okay. I definitely agree with that. Yeah, he's very calming for the staff um, okay. and the guests. Phoenix down. So Phoenix will work in both capacities really. Sure. Okay. Down. Um, yeah, I didn't realize uh, what an amazing effect he would have on the staff. You know, everybody loves a dog, of course, but they are truly obsessed with him and have bonded with him super fast. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, um, I didn't notice, does, <laughs> oh, is he okay? Excuse us. Uh, <laughs> does, does Phoenix, Phoenix has a vest on, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> wow, <Hi>. okay. <laughs> got a car. Are they okay? Yep. It's a dry okay. cod. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, so will they be living at the shelter? Um, I'm his handler, so okay. he comes to work with me every day. Okay. Um, and then he goes home, home with, with you. Me every okay. night. Yep. All right. So he puts in a 40-hour week. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 40-hour <laughs> week. Yeah. That's more yeah. than some people work that I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um... Okay, so so what what do the staff? I mean, you said they all kind of like, you mm -hmm. know, Phoenix yeah. being there. But uh, what have their their responses been like? Have they been pretty surprised by the calming effect that they that Phoenix gives to them? Or? I think so. When he starts snoring in our staff meetings, <laughs> everybody finds that very relaxing um, and funny. You know, they've uh, like he's this, looking for a paycheck right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Down, Phoenix. <laughs> yes, down. You know, it's it's it is it's amazing and fascinating what dogs can be taught to do. And now here just tonight, we've had two different breeds of dogs. Mm -hmm. um, people, like you said, mostly Labradors. When people think of service animals, <coughs> they think of Labradors or they think of Golden Retrievers. But you guys have had a ton of different dogs in the program. Mm -hmm. And I know later on we're going to show some of the graduates from the program. But all breeds, really. I mean, I think you've even had a poodle at one time, didn't you? We've had a number of poodles. Our poodles have been very standard poodles. are actually considered the third most popular service dog. Really? They've overtaken German Shepherds because they tend to be a little quieter. Huh. Now that's surprising to me. And mm -hmm. for anyone who doesn't know, a standard poodle is... It's a larger poodle. It's the not <laughs> the little miniature type poodles that I grew up with. You're you right. know, these right. are these are larger. Um, that's surprising to me. 
I, yeah. I they, would um, never have thought that. So German Shepherds um, have fallen out of favor for PTSD work, and most of the herding breeds are not preferred for PTSD work or psychiatric service dog work because when the person becomes super anxious, those are breeds of dogs that have been trained that naturally take over the situation. And we don't want the shepherd to take over. We don't want them to do what they are genetically programmed to do. Mm -hmm. Because if the person is, is having a pretty severe anxiety attack, we need to be able to have people help them and touch them. If that's what it's gonna take to help them through something like that, the shepherds may not allow it. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, you know, it's not that they're not capable of doing the work. It's that their genetic programming can kick in on you. Okay. And um, the poodles are also perceived as more approachable. Labs, Goldens, very approachable. Our boxers um, have this sense of humor associated with them. We've had really good luck with our boxers. Um, our boxers adore kids. They adore people. But they don't look the same. They don't have that same soft look to them. Mm-hmm. Um, that was part of the reason we thought Day by Day might be interested in him because he looks a little bit more like a street dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, But boxers are such great family dogs. Absolutely. I mean, they're wonderful with families. Do you have kids? I don't. You don't, um, okay. My coworkers, I was just telling Brenda before, um, two of them have uh, really young babies, uh, months old, and he is obsessed with them. And in a good my way. Coworkers <laughs> come in. Yeah, in such a good way. Um, yeah, yeah, he would be yeah, incredibly yeah. loving. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, there's just certain dogs that, I mean, I think all dogs can be trained to do something. All breeds of dogs mm -hmm. can be trained to do something, but, um, you know, boxers are, they're right up there with labs and goldens being good family type pets. One of the things that's really interesting about the poodles, especially when we first brought them into the program, you know, y y you have this image in your head of all these rough and tumble inmates and stuff like that. And ooh, I don't want a sissy poodle. <laughs> well, they quickly changed their mind when they actually saw them because I don't think they had the image in their mind, I mean, Poodles is just as big as Phoenix. I mean, they're big. Yeah. And they're very smart. Um, of the different breeds that we use, they are probably the smartest. And um, uh, they quickly change their mind. Uh, one of the things that makes them particularly suitable for uh, the PTSD or any service work for that matter is the <coughs> hypoallergenic aspect. Yes. Um, Poodles do not shed. To mm -hmm. some people, that's a big deal. Yeah. And um, so that's that's where we turn when we need that for a particular situation. Yeah, yeah. Is Phoenix okay or? I think he's fine. Maybe he's just restless. He's just yeah. doing a little stretching over yeah. there. Well, that's, that's good. Um, I want to talk um, about the difference between, you know, emotional support animals and, um, therapy dogs and, and service dogs, and we've got some screens that we can put up as we, as we talk about this. Why don't we start with um, the, the um, emotional support dogs. Tell us what an emotional support dog is. So an emotional support dog is a dog that provides comfort to a person by its presence. These dogs do an incredible job of helping their person, maybe reducing anxiety, um, but they haven't had task-based training. So they are not qualified to be a guide dog for somebody who's blind, for example. But they provide a very important service. These dogs are not covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act mm -hmm. um, because they're used in the home. Mm -hmm. These dogs um, do have some rights or some protections under the Fair Housing Act or under HUD. They used to have um, access rights to fly on airplanes and that's no longer in place since 2020. So we used to hear these stories about um, a dog on an airplane having a panic attack or you know something is, they're barking incessantly. In almost every case, that wasn't a service dog, that was an emotional support animal mm -hmm. 
who hadn't had the opportunities to have all the training for the dog to be prepared to be thrown into that type of a circumstance. Yeah, um, so I, um, I wanna just focus on that last item there, um, provided housing rights under the Fair Housing Act. So does that mean then, and we can pull that screen off now for a moment and, and uh, talk about this for a second here. Does that mean that if a dog, if a person has an emotional support dog, wherever they want to rent, the landlord must rent to them? Or is that only under like Section 8 housing, housing that is under some kind of government? No, that would be under any housing. Any housing. However, you have to have a letter from your doctor mm -hmm. um, articulating the disability and the perf you know what the dog needs to do. Um, and then there would also be a variety of stipulations like the dog can't be a nuisance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you can't say, well, I'm entitled to this apartment even though my dog's damaging things and he's barking incessantly, mm -hmm. right? So there's steps that they have to go through. They need to ask for an accommodation from their landlord and go through process for it. Yeah. But before <coughs> that um, act, they didn't have any recourse unless they owned their home. Yeah, and, and I know of one apartment building here in town that the uh, manager of that property has said, I don't care what the situation is, there's no dogs coming in here. Mm -hmm. And I told the people who live there, I said, I, I would file a complaint as mm -hmm. fast as you can file a complaint because that is just outright discrimination. I mean, they haven't even said no to a specific dog. It's just, nope, there's no dogs coming onto this property and that's the end of it. And this is a property that's been around for some time. And um, if, if I had, you know, a dog in the fight, so to speak, I'd be filing a complaint against mm -hmm. them because it's, landlords need to understand they can't just do that. All right, so let's pull up the next screen then and that's one on therapy dogs. Um, tell us about what therapy dogs are. So, my personal dog is a therapy dog, so we use that dog as an example. So um, I've done extensive training with him. I have taken him to dog training classes. I've taken him to places that allow dogs. Um, and he has demonstrated an interest in people. He likes to meet new people. He likes to be pet by people, and he likes to do those things. He's considered a registered therapy dog because we are members with the Alliance of Therapy Dogs. We've gone through testing and evaluation on it, and he and I as a partner are a registered team. So no matter how well trained he is, if my husband is handling him, he's not a therapy dog in those moments. As a registered team, and if I'm doing volunteer work, so he goes to the hospital with me, he goes to Evergreen Assisted Living with me, but he goes because he's invited. So he, it's not like he has rights to go to the hospital or rights to go to an assisted living center. That is granted to him because we have demonstrated those skills and those facilities would like therapy dogs on premise. Okay. He doesn't, I would have no rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, so he doesn't get to go to the grocery store. He doesn't get to go to restaurants. And there's nothing under the Fair Housing Act that would enable me to keep him if I was renting in a property that said no pets allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but he could go to restaurants if they just allow pets in general, right? Yeah, outside, yeah. Uh, you know, on patios and mm -hmm. things like that. The restaurants ha have all sorts of food safety rules and things that they have to follow. But yes, mm -hmm. we've got a few patios. and. Just because it's a patio doesn't mean he can go there. It has to be a patio that the owner of the establishment invites dogs to be there. Yeah. I, uh, I've got a lot of family in Arizona, and boy, there, there are dogs going in and out of places with people mm -hmm. all over the place, and mm -hmm. they don't have vests on, so they're not any kind of emotional support or therapy dog or service dog. Mm -hmm. It's just businesses there just welcome mm -hmm. animals in. And I mean, I'm talking, you know, hobby shops, grocery stores, um, Walgreens and CVS, and they've got something else out there. I can't think of the name of the, uh, of, of the um, pharmacy, but dogs are welcome almost everywhere. I'm not mm -hmm. gonna say every place, right, right. but it's, it's nice to see. And you know, we, we tend to 
things seem to start on one or two of the coasts and then they kind mm -hmm. of migrate in toward the middle of, of uh, our country. And so we're always kind of sort of on the last rung of acceptance <laughs> with some of these things, but it's nice to see. And we, and we do have a number of places around here where mm -hmm. dogs are allowed no yep. matter, I mean, just it can just be your family pet if they're well behaved. Right you can just take them and, yep. and it's not a problem. You mentioned one thing that's interesting there, the vest. Yes. And according to the uh, ADA, uh, a vest actually isn't required. However, Journey strongly encourages it because it's, it's like their business attire. Mm -hmm. You know, you put the vest on, time to work. And it also gives the public an indication that yes, this is a working dog and especially in Oshkosh, they actually honor it pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've been around here and in enough of the business and things like that that uh, been in schools and enough kids have seen them and educated their parents and yeah, uh, yeah. that it actually wor is working out pretty good. But uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that ADA says they don't actually have to have a vest, but we think it's a great idea. Well, I agree because a, that way the dog knows it's time to work mm -hmm. and not just play or whatever. But B, other people in the public, in the general public, they won't come up and, oh, hey, how you doing, puppy, and, and this kind of thing, as they would if the dog didn't have a vest on. Mm -hmm. You know, they know it's a service type animal of mm -hmm. some sort, and they know that they should probably ask if they can pet the dog. So I, I agree, I think the vests are, are a great idea. Well, let's talk about you know the, the actual true service dogs and what, what benefits they are afforded. <coughs> Excuse me. So for a dog to be considered a service dog, it will have been individually trained to do tasks specific to the person's disability. So for example, if a dog is trained to be a guide dog, and I'm not blind, he is not a service dog when he's with me because he doesn't mitigate a disability that I have. So it's really important for people to understand that just because you have a service dog, if I hand it off to my husband and my husband has no disabilities, it stops having those rights. Um, it has to be trained to do what I need it to do to help me, mm -hmm. and it has to be so that it would help me go out in public. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense for a service dog that only needs to do something in my house because then I don't need to take a dog out in public and right. the way Journey treats that which is a little bit tighter than what ADA says but we don't feel like dogs need to be out in public necessarily mm -hmm. unless they're super well trained they're going to be a credit and they're going to help their person not just along because I want to have my dog along with me. Okay. All right, um, what are things that a store, and we can pull that screen down mm -hmm. now, um, what are things that a store owner or a manager may ask and may not ask if you're entering the store with a service dog? Right, so <coughs> they're, they're allowed under the Americans with Disabilities Act to ask two questions. Number one, is the dog needed because of your disability? And they may ask, what task does the dog perform? They may not ask me if I'm diabetic. They may not ask me what my health condition is that the dog is helping me with. They may only ask me, what task does the dog perform? Which is what's outlining why the dog is with me to go into a public location. We shouldn't see dogs in, in um, grocery carts. We shouldn't see dogs in carts in Menards or Lowe's or places like that. In most cases, a dog couldn't perform its task if it was in something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but from a general courtesy to the public, we shouldn't be putting our service dogs on things that anybody in the public might be using. So, for example, it doesn't say it anywhere, but all of our all of our people are trained. You don't put a service dog on a chair that a human would sit on, mm -hmm. because not everybody likes dogs. And someone might be allergic. Absolutely, and if you <coughs> take advantage, you kind of ruin it for everybody else. It's mm -hmm. kind of like the dog park. People don't pick up 
the dog <laughs> waste at the dog park, yeah. it ruins the dog park for everybody else. Yeah. And it's very important that service dog handlers are careful to be extremely respectful of the general public because not everybody enjoys dogs and that's mm -hmm. okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we should see these dogs being quiet. We should see, we should almost not see them. The ideal scenario is if we wouldn't have gotten Zinn up, she would be under this table and you wouldn't know she was with us. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we really want because yeah. the person with a disability also doesn't want to draw attention to themselves. They want to go shopping. Mm -hmm. They want to buy whatever they need to buy at the store. Um, a courtesy for the public is don't stare at my service dog. Don't ask to pet my service dog. Um, and don't be offended when I say you can't pet it because I'm not saying that to be a jerk. I'm saying that because my dog has to focus on me and has to pay attention to me. And if you interrupt it, it might not catch that I'm having a diabetic high or low. Mm -hmm. Those are the reasons that we don't want the dog's pet in public, not because we just don't want you touching our dogs, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just like a child when they're studying, you don't go and poke the child and you know interact <laughs> with the child and do stuff, right? And try to get well, their attention. Well, hopefully people don't. <laughs> right, very good. Um, the same thing is true with the dogs. We wanna have them focus. Wisconsin has an extra advantage to it that isn't under the Americans with Disabilities Act. In Wisconsin, our, um, our government was forward thinking enough to say that service dogs in training have the same public access rights as fully trained service dogs. That means that all of our dogs in training, like Zen, gets to go places and get those experience with trainers so that then they're gonna be ready to go and work for somebody with a disability. That's really a smart thing because how else are they supposed to get that training, you know? Some so. states require you to call the establishment and request permission. Hmm. Um, so it's different by state by state, um, but that is a benefit we have in Wisconsin. Um, and that's why you can see our dogs in training. Sure. You've had um, 43 inmate volunteers so far participate in the uh, we program? Always, we have 43 when we're fully staffed. We've had a couple hundred since the beginning of oh, the program. Oh, okay. So at one time then? Yes. Okay, wow. Okay, At Excellent. any given point in time, we go in and we instruct the inmates how to train the dogs. So like on Tuesday night, I have 43 handlers that are we're interacting with. Wow. And how many of you from service, from you know, Journey um, Together Service Dog go up in? Up to six of us will go in okay. on Tuesday nights. Thursday afternoons, Brad and I go in and we do smaller, more <laughs> focused things at that time. We but were just there a few hours ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we just came out of prison. <laughs> All right, um, so w I wanna put up, a, you've, we've got a couple of screens of um, the dogs that have graduated the mm -hmm. program so mm -hmm. far, because I want people to get a feel for, um, you know, some of the the d various breeds mm -hmm. that have graduated. So hopefully we can bring that up. Um, waiting for the, there we go. A lot of labs, Yep. but not all. I see mm -hmm. some poodles there. Um, <coughs> yes. You'll see a Vishla there. Um, the Which one's the Vishla? I can't you really. Our uh, logo is on the bottom right corner. Oh, yeah. If you go up one and in one. Yep. Okay. Kind of the brownish, um, yeah. tan yeah. color. So that's unusual. Um, you don't see. Yeah, you don't see them. many Vishlas at all. Um, and around here. He anyway. w he was an awesome dog. He was placed during COVID. He now travels the country. Hmm. Um, on the top row is Ross. He was a mixed breed. Which um, one on the very end? Um, uh, like way on to the right, there's a boxer on the top row, yes. and then one in is Ross. Okay. He's at Christine Ann Domestic Abuse Center with a therapist there. Oh, in is, so is he like a facility dog yes, there? Okay. He absolutely is. Oh, what's his name? Ross. Ross, okay. Um, Ross goes in, he has his own calendar, so they can make appointments <laughs> to meet with Ross. Oh um, my God, that's funny. Way on the bottom left corner, since we're talking about facility dogs, is Ember um, or Pepper. Um, she is with the Waukesha District Attorney's Office. Okay. So she does courthouse dog duties. She worked extensively with the um, victims of the Waukesha Parade. Event. Oh, yes. 
Oh, I probably saw her on TV then mm -hmm. during the trial mm -hmm. when the yeah. victims yep. came in. I noticed yep. that they had a yep. dog there. That was Pepper. Um, Magic is on the bottom row in the middle. She's yeah. the one with Oshkosh Police Department. And she's been on this show before. She and her handler. And she's a smiler. She mm -hmm. is. I yeah. love that dog. Yeah. I just, she's, yeah. but so I'm a sucker for all dogs. Well. So. Um, so, you know, you talk about, you know, the Waukesha County DA's office. So how far of a geographic area do you guys cover then when you are training dogs to go somewhere? Um, the furthest away I think we have is a, we have a dog in Sparta with the Sparta Police Department okay. and we have a dog in Manaqua, another okay. facility dog. We don't like to go that far away with our service dogs um, because of the nature of the training. Um, our training is not fixed duration, so we don't say you're going to come and in two weeks you're going to be fully trained and take this dog home with you. Our training is based on um, a repetition and a cadence, and we go until the person is comfortable with the dog. Okay. We don't care. Um, as long as they're making progress and the dog's looking like it's a good fit, we're going to go until everybody feels comfort comfortable and confident. Okay. Um, I know our time is winding down. Um, I've got a lot of notes here, but you guys also sent me some notes. Have we covered everything that you wanted to cover? Oh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, um, so I want to go back to talking about when you're taking a service dog into a store. Um, can, can they ask, so they can't ask what the disability is but they can ask what the dog can do. They can't ask the dog to perform something, right? Exactly, they are not allowed to require the dog to perform the task. Okay, all right. Um, and I guess one thing that would help for everybody to remember, um, you can't see all disabilities. Oh my God, that was, that was my next thing here. <laughs> I, I was cheating. Um, <laughs> So you can't look at a person and, and say, well, I think that's a fake service dog because you look completely healthy, right? Um, you can't see PTSD, you can't see anxiety disorders, mm -hmm. you can't see diabetes or epilepsy. Um, and as a, per a person who's shopping in a store, it's not my prerogative to ask them about their service dog. Mm -hmm. um, that's for the store. If, if you thought you saw a dog acting inappropriately, you would report it to the store. You wouldn't approach the person with the dog. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, yeah, I think that's a good point to make. And, and that, honestly, it was my next mm -hmm. question for you. Um, you don't, I mean, most, let's face it, most disabilities, I don't think that we can see. Mm -hmm. You know, and people need to understand that because I've heard people comment to me, oh, you know, like when I'll tell people that, oh, I've got this dog coming on the show or I've got this group coming on the show, that'll strike up a conversation and then they'll say, oh, you know, it's really unfair how some people take advantage of this and they take their own dogs in and say that they're this and say that they're that. And, you know, it's all just a bunch of crap, Cheryl, you know, because not all these dogs are service dogs. Mm -hmm. and. I said, you, you don't know that, you can't say that. You know, you can't see what disability the, or different ability the person mm -hmm. might have. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't see that. Um, I don't know, think, comments like that from people just drive me up a wall because they think they know it all and they don't. Mm -hmm. Just like they don't know it all, they can't see it all. Mm -hmm. And so they need to understand that. Um, the dogs are trained, uh, on different pieces of equipment and things like that. And I'm not talking about like agility training, mm -hmm. but I, I know when you guys did a program at, at my church a year or so ago, um, they were showing some of the, some pictures of some of the um, equipment that mm -hmm. they're trained on. Mm -hmm. Can we just talk for a moment or two about that? Sure. We've got about four and a half minutes left. Oh, sure. Um, we use a variety of fitness equipment um, and you, we put a lot of things to use. Our dogs need to be extremely confident. Physical confidence will breed emotional confidence on the dog. So if the dog sees something weird, like let's say they're gonna step through a ladder. It's a ladder, extension ladder is laying on the ground and we have to go through it or go over it. We want the dogs to be like, yeah, I can do that. I can walk through that no without a deal. problem. No big deal. So we have a variety of things, like we literally have um, 
wooden simulated ladders and the dogs walk through the ladders or we have slatted so that the dogs will walk across something that has holes in it where they can see below so that they build that confidence. We also want them to be able to move their rear end separate from their front end so that these big dogs can navigate in tight spaces. Okay. So like Phoenix, for example, he needed that because he isn't going to back under that chair. That's a big body to turn around and, yeah. and do that. Yeah. Um, and we also worry about their fitness. So we do fitness exercises with the dogs. We do stretching with them. They, um, they go up on blow up dog equipment. So like it looks like a big egg they stand on, which causes them to use different muscles and strengthens their core so that they're able to um, have that confidence sure. and able to do that stuff. We have different surfaces. We take, we, um, we do a training exercise, we call it silly surfaces. We'll have all different things. We'll put a garbage bag down on the floor and weight the corners so they walk across the garbage bag because that's slippery and it slips on the carpeting. Um, we use bath mats. Um, bubble wrap. Bubble wrap is oh, another bubble one. wrap. <laughs> Walking on bubble wrap, you know, all the little crackling sounds and stuff. So um, those are the kinds of things that w we're doing stuff constantly to sure. build those dogs up and make them comfortable. Sure, absolutely. Well, that's great. Before our time is completely up, Denise, I want to just find out a few things about, you know, day by day. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you've been building, I'm sure most people in town know, you've been building a new facility. Yeah. Um, you are having a grand opening when? Um, we had that, it was last week. Oh, so. okay. Yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, Last week, good. all right. Really good turnout. If you would like to set up a tour aside from that, reach out. And I can okay. Do that for you. And what hours are you open? Um, the, our emergency shelter is still 6 p.m. till 8 a.m. Okay. Um, but daytime hours are for programming. So if they're coming for rent smart classes or therapy appointments, one on one appointments, they can come in for that stuff okay. during the day. And is it a year round shelter then? Year round now, 365 nights a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's. Uh, Wow, has this yeah. been needed forever, mm -hmm. uh, you know? How many um, guests can you um, accommodate at any one time? We're a 50-bed facility now. Okay. So for 35-ish um, of our beds, they're on a 30, 60, 90-day plan. We're programming, um, they have to tick different boxes each month, and about 15-ish beds, still the lottery-style beds for those needing the emergency services, maybe okay. not long-term. And let me ask this, because I know, you know, you guys help them, you know, they can come in and do laundry and people can come in and learn uh, how to write a resume and that kind of stuff. Are those the kinds of things that you do during the daytime hours then? Yep. Yep. The rent okay. smart classes, getting them connected with FSET. Um, we do have a health and human service coordinator as well, so she gets uh, assessments in helping them meet their dental, medical, mental health, uh, ADO, AD. Um, AODA goals. Okay, all right. And I, we're going to have you back uh, on a show when we can really talk for, you know, the full sure. hour because this, it always goes by so fast and, but it's I was, I was grateful to have the chance to meet Phoenix and, and you and at least hear a little bit about it and I'm sorry I blew it on your grand opening but oh my, okay. my life has been a little bit crazy lately. <laughs> So anyway, thanks to all of you for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you guys on. And um, it's, it's never the same dogs. It's always new dogs. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so that's fun, too. So um, thank you all again. And um, thanks to my crew. Most of all, thanks to all of you. We will see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.